And hello to you. Welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Coleman. And I am Louise Palanker. You know, Media Path is a podcast where we offer you choices. Movie, broadcast, streaming, cable, internet, entertainment choices. We find something new and interesting. We say, check this out. You say, I like that. And we say, oh, if you like that, why don't you try this? And the next thing you know, we've helped you avoid all of your chores and responsibilities and our work is complete. Plus, <laughs> we have amazing guests and uh, I'm really anxious to talk to these guys because they've done some work that's part of my generation. Dennis Lambert and Bob Sarles will be right with us. Weezy, what do you have for your first choice today? Okay, so Fritz, you've watched Operation Varsity Blues. I have, and I, my stomach still hurts. Okay, yes, it is painful, but we're going to revisit this. So it's uh, this is Operation Varsity Blues, the college admission scandal. It's from director Chris Smith. This hybrid doc drama is a deep dive into the fraudulent methods used by sociopathic mastermind Rick Singer to get the children of rich and famous families into elite universities. Singer is chillingly reenacted by Matthew Modine using transcripts of actual conversations with parents who succumb to the scam. This is a mouth agape, head holding stunner of a film. We knew the story, but watching the seduction of the so easily seduced is truly confounding. The children of rich and powerful people appear to be seen by them as ornamental chess pieces. Uh, honey, I need to place you here at USC because you see the cardinal and gold vanity sticker will pair nicely <laughs> with my red Lamborghini. <laughs> Even or especially kids who would have done well on their own were at the mercy of these parents. In the case of Lori Laughlin's daughter, Olivia Jade, for example, she was by 18. She had created a social media branding identity. Her reputation was severely tarnished by her mother's desire to cheat her kid into a bragging rights school when college may not have even been the best path for this particular kid. Fritz, your thoughts. Well, so much of this resonated with me because I have a daughter in college right now and I'm tired of being accused of faking her way in. <laughs> but um, there were a couple of revelations in this. First of all was the sailing coach from Stanford who was the least culpable because he never accepted any money on his own for what, what transpired. But he got thrown under the bus because the head of Athletics at Stanford refused to say that he had been involved or knew anything about this. I felt bad for that guy because at least he had a, a semi-moral center. But the other um, astonishing piece of information in this was that this guy uh, had two entrances to get what you want. You had the side door and the back door. The side door was he would help you fake the fact that you had been, say, uh, the second person on a crew, although you had never been in a boat before, and you would Photoshop yourself into a picture of a crew, and then he would get you as an unofficial part of the crew team or something, which is mind blowing. But the, the, the revelation to me was the guy who wanted to go in the back door, which is just to make an out and out donation to the college of your choice and hope that they are impressed with your donation and will let your child in. And he said, OK, well, I, my son wants to go to Harvard. I'll make a one to two million dollar donation. You think that'll get their attention? The guy said, no, twenty five to fifty million dollars. And, and thus, thought, it's thus over. The system, Jared, Jared the, Kushner. Oh, my God. That, 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 that's whose name came up a, right away. Beneficiary of that technique. <laughs> but the other thing that was like chilling was how, you know, you would say that your child had a learning uh, difference and the ch child needs to take the test one-on-one uh, -on -one with just a monitor, but then the monitor would be the guy that would take the test for your kid. So your kid would actually think that she had scored like this. And one of the moms is like, well, my one kid will, you know, she'll go for that. But my other kid will be like, well, I, don't, I don't have a learning difference. So how do I, what do I say to my kid? In other words, help me lie to my child, uh, the whole thing. Uh, I, I know. It's just. How do you suspend your disbelief long enough to think that this is going to advantage your child? and that this isn't going to completely crush their moral center, uh, especially if they find out about it. Some of the parents were embarrassed that their kids didn't know anything about it, or they were embarrassed to have their kids find out about it. Yeah. But, but many of them did because, hey, wait, I'm on the crew team. I have to go to crew practice. 
I've never rode a crew thing. No, so, they never even showed up. They were they were deemed walk-ins and they would never yeah. even show up for practice. They just got into the school and then that was it. So it's like the kid in the pool, you know, posing for a water polo photo and isn't saying, hey, dad, you know, wh what, are, wh why are we, is this cosplay? What's happening? Uh I didn't know you were into this, but it's it's just so it's so strange that everybody just kind of like moves along. And the concept that there's only like 10 schools that would be acceptable when the when our country is full of wonderful universities with great professors and great programs where your kids will learn. And it's not essential that your kid goes to one of these kind of like marquee schools. It's just it's so it, exactly. Strange. And truthfully, that's the overarching point of this whole thing is how awful the and how competitive and how manic the whole college entrance thing is starting from the time kids are in ninth grade and a lot of this is parents trying to live unfulfilled dreams for themselves and the pressure they put on these kids is just it's illegal it should be illegal but an uh, uh, interesting film for sure i have another environmental documentary okay uh, but this one will shake you to your core Th this is a filmmaker setting out to document the harm that humans are doing to marine life. Now, this isn't a new topic, but one that goes further down the rabbit hole in this film. This group did two more environmental docs, one called Cowspiracy instead of Seaspiracy, which is this one's name. Uh, a Cowspiracy pulled back the curtain on large scale factory farming. This one does the same thing for seafood. It's directed and narrated by Ali Tabrizi, it's a guided tour of the ocean with lots of important facts about how important sharks and dolphins are to our ecosystem. The focal point is the damaging effects of commercial fishing on our planet. Here's a fact. 85% of the oxygen we breathe comes from our seas and commercial fishing is ruining it. It takes on what's called the bycatch issue. Bycatch is the stuff that's caught in fishing nets that isn't really supposed to be caught, isn't part of the catch, like sharks and dolphins, and they just throw these creatures away. Another opener is uh, eye opener is that if you see a label in a supermarket that says a sustainable fishing product, be very suspect because it often isn't. It talks about overfishing and fish farms not being a good solution. It talks about fishing nets. It, it, it tells us that fishing nets are 50% of the plastic pollution problem in the ocean, not bottles and bags. Fishing nets are made out of plastic and they're the problem. But uh, a really good one that, 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 that points out that we're very close to being at a tipping point where whatever we do is not going to matter. So I know it sounds depressing, but I think it's your responsibility to watch this film it, 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 uh, and if you're interested in it, I would recommend that earlier film, Cowspiracy, which opens the curtain on factory farming. Between Cowspiracy and Seaspiracy, you'll only want to eat food made from lagoons from hmm. now on. Does it offer any any uh, potential solutions? Yeah, yeah. They, there's, a, there's a little flourish of positivity at the end, but it's it's important. I'm so happy to talk to this guy. This is a very inspirational story to me, especially for old guys who are trying to see how they still matter on the planet. And this is a good story. This is Dennis Lambert, our first guest. He's a two-time Songwriters Hall of Fame nominee who produced 100 albums, and he's written 600 songs, including 80 Billboard Top 100 hits. 37 gold and platinum albums worldwide, 20 gold and platinum singles worldwide as a songwriter and producer. Dennis is the man behind, I mean, iconic American hits. Ain't No Woman Like The One I've Got, The Four Tops. We Built This City, one of the great rock anthems from Starship, Night Shift, Rhinestone Cowboy, are you kidding me? One Tin Soldier from the movie Billy Jack, Baby Come Back, Don't Pull Your Little Rat, Hamilton, Joe Frank and Reynolds, and Pink Cadillac. He's a 12-time Grammy nominee and a two-time American Music Award winner for Record of the Year. He's written or produced for Tony Bennett, The Temptations, and uh, Natalie Cole, Kenny Loggins, Cher, The Supremes, The Commodore, Santana, The Righteous Brothers, George Benson, Ziggy Marley, Jefferson Starship, and The Four Tops. Weezy, tell us about this really wonderful documentary, a personal documentary about Dennis. Well, Dennis is friends with my cousin, Alan Palenker, who invited me to see this documentary. It's called Of All the Things. 
And of all the things captures Dennis's return to the stage in the Philippines, where he is a huge star. As the film begins, Dennis is selling real estate in Florida, and his son Jody is continuously telling him, hey, Dad, you know that solo album that you made in 1972? Well, it is all the rage and remains all the rage in the Philippines. His song, of all the things, is a wedding standard. You you cannot get married without the song. It's the law <laughs> in the Philippines. They, they keep begging him to come and perform, but Dennis has basically hung up his keyboard and he's feeling a little rusty. Jody says, okay, dad, if you pick up your keyboard, I will pick up my camera. Let's go do this adventure ensues. This heart melting story is currently being developed into a feature film by Imagine Entertainment. So what touches us in the story is the emotion in the faces of the Filipino people who have worshipped you for years, Dennis, and now here you are. Can you describe what that experience felt like for you? Yeah, well, I knew about it, of course. Uh, over the years, I had conversations with the promoter and with some record company executives, but uh, it was so far away. And at that particular time, success in places like that was hard to measure in the United States, because unless you you received a significant amount of money from a territory like that from your recordings, you just didn't believe that anything important could be happening. And and I can tell you, I never did receive very much money from that from that part of the world. So I, I couldn't imagine that it was that successful. But when I finally said yes and we ventured out over there, it was just life changing and mind blowing, as you probably saw if you saw the documentary. Yes. You know, the things that were going on, the way we were greeted, the way that people stopped to talk to us and, and, and tell us their story and how my music had affected them. The, the general feeling in, in Manila and all throughout the, uh, the country where we went to do our various shows you know, there were posters and billboards the size of half, you know, like on Broadway, like on 42nd Street. I mean, it was insane. But we, we got to set the stage for this, though, because this isn't like somebody who spent his life touring and then took up like a 10 year break. You were not a live performer. You, right. you performed in the studio and recorded stuff. Right. So you, you decided. And, and I think one of the most moving parts of the movie is when your wife was giving you spiritual permission to go do this because it would be a great piece of your life and it helped you make up your mind. But then you had to dust off these old songs that you hadn't played in 35 years. Right. Sometimes never having recorded, uh, never having performed them in front of a live audience ever. Right. And then you had to put together this group. And the fun part was you teaching the vocals to Filipino backup singers when you got over there. How many players did you take with you? I didn't take any. It was, so everybody, it was all. All Filipino. Man, oh, man. Yeah. And, and I just thought, well, how, what amount of pressure can you put on yourself? And you, you were selling out these giant venues. Yeah. That yeah, first the, venue in Manila was like 15,000 people or something. In there. Yeah, it's the Thriller in Manila Stadium. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was it. And he sold it out. I was walking those hallways and there were the posters of the big fight. Thriller in Manila, and of course, a, a host of other incredible artists that had appeared in that venue over the many years that it's been there. Yeah, Paul Williams had done a, a, a thing similar to you. And yes, absolutely. Yeah. They just love ballads. They just go crazy for them, and it just means everything to them. Yeah, very sentimental. Very, you know, they love music. Music is so important to the Philippine culture. And, uh, and they passed this music on from generation to generation. At my show, there were literally people like me, my age, who were really the grandparents of the youngest people that came with them. They brought their children and their grandchildren, and they all knew the music, which was kind of crazy. But your story, I mean, I, I retired a year ago from the broadcasting business. Your story about this great third act discovery you made is a dream to some, you know, American men our age. You yeah. were this historically successful songwriter and producer, and you had reached a point where you admitted in the film that your the work had dried up a little bit, and you had a sense that 
uh, th this was going to be maybe the end, the, the close of the door. Well, right. not everybody, particularly an artist, the person that uses their creativity, recovers from that. I think you're the exception of the rule. You went on to reinvent yourself to become a very successful real estate agent in Boca Raton, Florida, which is where my parents live for 15 years. I had their 50th wedding anniversary at the Boca Raton Hotel, and I'm still paying for it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but but but, uh, but but a successful career. So you had a healthy transformation to a second act. Not everybody's able to do that, particularly really creative people. Right. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this opportunity presents itself uh, to go and perform where you're hugely popular in the Philippines. It's like a fever dream you have as an older person. I right. wish this would have happened to me before I got too old. It was a really <laughs> touching story. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, it was pretty uh, unusual. And it's not something that typically happens to, to someone. But I happen to have made an album when I was making my music and writing songs and producing records in those early years. The people at Dunhill Records, which was an incredibly great company. I mean, it was the home of the Mamas and Papas and Three Dog Night and the Grassroots and Mama Cass and the James Gang and we had a host of people signed as songwriters as well, who were not necessarily recording for the label. Uh, so one of my friends was Kenny Loggins, who was signed as a, as a songwriter. And uh, it was uh, it was an amazing time. And they encouraged me to make a record. And they knew I didn't want to tour because I didn't want to put anything I was doing at risk and, and be sent out on the road, you know, for six months and and lose touch with what I was doing as a producer and as a songwriter. So they said, listen, you're, you're a top 40 artist. You're a pop artist like Neil Diamond was, or, you know, people like that, Elton John. And if you're, if you're, if you make hits, you might want to tour, you know, you might want to go out there and take advantage of your success. So until we get you on the radio and we establish some kind of a pattern of success, you don't have to tour. And, and that was, the, the, the answer I needed to hear because I didn't want to put my career in, in jeopardy. So I made the record and they and they went all out to promote it. I have to say they spent money. They, they had a plan, they had time and they made a great effort. And it just didn't connect. It didn't it didn't happen. I think we might have put the wrong music out first. Choosing the right single was important. And we we sort of had a bit of a hiccup and it just didn't didn't work. I mean, we did. That was your only album, too. First and only, only album. That's yeah. why it's really lightning striking that it hits so yeah. big in the Philippines. Do you wow. know how it made its way there? Or was there a disc jockey that first played a cut from it? Do you have that history? Yes, I do know. Uh, the promoter, who I ultimately uh, went there to work for and who put, put this tour together, as a long, uh, a long standing promoter, probably the biggest promoter in the Philippines. He's brought everybody there uh, who, who is anyone from the US, from England. And he's been doing this for 30 some odd years. But at the time in 1972, he was a very young disc jockey at the top 40 station in Manila. And he was, wow. he was often serviced with new records by the local promotion people that were uh, few and far between, but they worked for various labels that were all kind of thrown under the umbrella of one distributing company. And he told me the story. He said, your album was handed to me. They said, you should listen to this. And he said, and I took it home and I started to play it. And he said, I listened to various cuts and it was really, uh, it drew me in and there was something about it. I couldn't put down and I liked so much of it. And I started playing it. I had the freedom to play things I liked. And uh, he said it started to, to stick. My phones would light up in the studio. We'd get calls. What is that? Can you play that again? And you know, more often than not, it happened to be that song of all the things, which is what the movie is called as well. And uh, one thing kind of led to another. He said it then spread to other stations in other cities and it became very popular in Manila. He said, I remember when he told me this and I really chuckled, but he said, you know, we're going to go to Cebu. We're going to go to 
uh, Davao and all, all these cities, you know, throughout the Philippines. But he said, but the he said, Manila is your crowd. <laughs> 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 well, I said, my crowd. <laughs> what does that mean? He said, you know, in Manila, they're more sophisticated. They they really understood this record. They they bought it. They supported it. And so that's what happened. And I finally went over and, you know, did it after all those years. I think one of the charming parts of the movie was how humble you were when people would say hello. It was like you were making a new friend with every hand you shook, but you were very the smile on your face and the warmth was really interesting. There was no, it wasn't like people had a sense they were meeting a big star. It was, it was, uh, it was very charming. Yeah. And, well, I feel like I'm pretty sentimental. You know, I, yeah. I love old, the old music that I grew up listening to. I mean, it was influenced by a wide variety of, of stuff. And so when I have the opportunity to hear people, uh, talk about how they connected with my songs. It's it's kind of unusual. You don't get that very yeah, often. It's great. It was so yeah, because usually you're, you know, in your case, for example, you're not the artist. So if someone's connecting with Night Shift or with We Built the City, you're not necessarily hearing about that connection. That's it's right. the members right. of the of the groups are hearing about Except it. Except the people behind the scenes. And, sure. you know, we've I've had plenty of acknowledgement for what was my whole, you know, the sum of my career. Uh, but it's mostly by people from the business who knew what I was doing and who noted my work and, and hired me from time to time. Uh, but this was different because it was the public and I understood why this was important. It, it took me a long time to kind of get it because I kept saying no, thinking that it would have little value. But in fact, it had the most incredible uh, effect on me and changed everything. Too bad it didn't happen 10 or 20 years earlier because I could have done more with it. <laughs> hey, you're, you're young. You're young. Now it's being turned into a movie by Ron Howard and Brian Grazer. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's not a whole lot I can say uh, except that uh, this little movie, this documentary film that my son did, you know, going back now or 10 years ago, just doesn't seem to want to go away. And, and I say that because we tried after the movie was released in festivals, which is where it started and played, I think, more than 30 around the country and around the world uh, and was really being incredibly well received. What I didn't realize uh, down, to, down to the minutia was just how expensive that movie might become when we tried to release it commercially. Uh -huh. Oh, in you the mean festivals, because festivals, they give you like a free ride. Right. You mean because of the rights? Because of all the rights. Okay. Yeah. And and I don't think any of us really paid a whole lot of attention to it. We knew if we ever sold the doc, it would be an issue. But somehow, you know, we thought it'll work itself out if the doc is well received. And it was. But when we came to, to sell it, and then remember, this was 2007 when I went there and the movie came out in 08, 09. And in 08, the, the, the country melted down and the world was not in very mm -hmm. good shape either, you know, because of what was going on financially in those markets. So we couldn't find a buyer that was still uh, reasonably whole and able to, to fund something like this, an acquisition. And of course, when, even if it was free, as often documentaries are, they, they can, you know, come out play in a festival, do really well. And the uh, owners of the doc, the producers, essentially, and maybe the director, they don't, they know there's nothing in it that would cost any money to, to speak of. So when they make a deal for its distribution, it's cheap, but not in our case. Uh, we, we went in and did the, the, uh, the, the work for, you know, whoever would ultimately have to negotiate. And we said, let's go in there since I, you know, I was involved with all the music and let's see if we can cut a good deal. And we, and we did, we thought we did. And as it turned out, when you added it all up, there were 31 songs in the documentary. So there were 31 recordings. There were 31 songs that someone owned and wrote. I did a lot of them, of course, you know, uh, and then there were videos of certain of the artists and then there were magazine covers and all of those things have to be licensed. Then we were well over a hundred thousand dollars and we couldn't get anybody to even take a second look when they knew the money was that substantial. So sadly it didn't get released commercially. On the other hand, 
uh, this imagined deal is our second attempt. Uh, not that we initiated it, we didn't, uh, but it's the second major studio to try to develop this into a feature film. So who will uh, play you? Well, we don't know, but you know, uh, there are some obvious people that we all like. It has to be somebody somewhere between, you know, 55 and 65, if they are going to play it somewhat true to the story we told. And there aren't that many actors who, you know, maybe could sing a little, who aren't afraid to do something kind of bold. It may uh, have to be Tom Hanks. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, we thought about Tom Hanks. We <laughs> thought about Michael Keaton. We thought yeah. about and, you know, we're leaving it to imagine to do what they do best and, and the people there that are passionate about exciting. it. The best thing that happened, frankly, uh, because we had been previously uh, optioned at Warner Brothers Pictures and we, we were thrilled because it was Steve Carell that was involved in the development of the film. But sadly, they didn't get a good script written. They actually had two scripts commissioned and neither of them frankly, were very good. And it wasn't just that we felt that way. Steve Carell felt that way. And so did the studio when all was said and done. So it sort of died on the vine and we got it back after it was there for a few years. And we thought, well, that's it. That's going to be the end of it. You know, nobody's going to resurrect this now when it's six years old. And then along comes Imagine. And it was the same sort of thing. It was one of the executives there that remembered it. And they called my son, who by now is a fairly well-established filmmaker and writer, and and asked what the status was. And, you know, he went in and took a meeting with the Imagine people, and they were just enchanted by the doc. You know, the only one who had seen it is the president of the studio, a woman by the name of Karen Lunda. So she was the one that was responsible for bringing it in. But when Brian and Ron read, you know, uh, saw the doc and, and, and uh, uh, met with Jody, you know, they were convinced there was something there and they hired Jody to write the screenplay, which oh, made all wow. the sense in the world because he understood the subject matter and he was really hoping that would happen at Warner Brothers and it didn't. Okay. So when we had this opportunity the second time around, we were very, very interested in pursuing it because they were interested in Jody. And mm -hmm. that was to us. I, I think the film has one of the great examples of the ups and downs of trends and taste in the music business, where we built this city. I was voted by like Cream Magazine or Rolling Stone as one of the worst songs ever written in rock and yeah. roll. It was notoriously bad. Now, it's one of the great rock anthems. I'm trying to think what song at a karaoke bar would do better than We Built This City. Probably none. No, but we, no. Built, the, we built the city. We're not going to let Dennis talk about his own song. Fritz and I are going to just talk about it right now. But We Built This City <laughs> is, is a song that's always going to be voted worst and best. And there are songs that fall into that category. The reason why is because people are afraid to admit that they like it. And that's it's a song that back, everyone that loves. I refuse to believe that anyone who ever downvotes it actually hates it. They're just afraid to admit that they love it. Because so it's bad it's, polling is what it is. No, no, it's just people are afraid to admit that they love something so joyful. Yeah, it's an anthem. I just love it. I, you can't help yourself when, when it comes on to sing. I mean, I guess it's kind of the lyrics are a little bit ridiculous because it's just it's it's a flaming tribute to rock and roll that rock and roll has the capacity to build cities and erect buildings so it's like kind of ridiculously over the top and that's the only reason it would get a down vote other than that it's the greatest song ever written yeah and in the film at least grace slick was honest about why she wanted a hit record she said i think it's time uh, i have a hit before i wrap up my career here i want to i want a, a big hit and she she I guess she, my right center, she, she greenlit the thing and it turned yeah. out to be huge. But like, let's get Dennis's thoughts on We Built the City. You write that song and are you thinking like, OK, this is a bit much or this is perfect? Like what gave you the idea for the song? Well, it was actually a very unusual situation, not one that I had ever encountered. Or maybe I encountered something like it once or twice, but uh, nothing that turned out this way. Um, 
a friend of mine, a songwriter by the name of Martin Page that I'd written songs with. And yeah, he wrote These Dreams for Heart uh, and other th songs that were really good. And he and I had gotten to know each other and written together. And he, when he knew that I was working on getting a new album together for uh, the Starship, he sent me some songs. I asked him to, you know, if you have anything you think I might like, send them over because the group's all ears and we're ready and they're not writing a whole lot. You know, they're, they're leaving it to us to find them great songs. So he sent me two or three songs and I checked them out. And one of them was a version, quote unquote, of We Built the City that he wrote with Bernie Taupin. Oh. You know, Elton John's mm -hmm. primary collaborator and a great their assistant someone whose work you don't typically mess with, you know? Mm -hmm. So I called Martin after I spent time with it. I, I, I wasn't doing this alone. I played it for the guys I was working with before the band heard it. And they shared my enthusiasm. I said, it's not right, but there's something about this song that's very haunting, and very interesting. And, and it wasn't, as you know, it, it wasn't that happy, upbeat, intensely commercial, uh, in your face kind of up tempo song it was right. dark and broody and odd but the essence of it was the same you know the the lyric content was the same and that's what attracted me i thought this is like their theme this could be the you know jefferson airplanes theme because yeah. they they built san francisco along with some other people as a you know incredible music uh, uh city and a and a town that, you know, gave birth, I guess, to progressive music, as we think of it from that mm -hmm. era, the 60s and 70s. So uh, I called Martin and I explained the situation. And I said, you know, there's just no way we could even play it for the group like this. They'll think we're nuts, you know. So can you raise with Bernie the idea that maybe you could do some work to this. And I gave him my ideas a little bit, you know, a sketch of what I thought it needed. And I mean, he sounded on the other end of the phone, scratching his head and thinking, oh, man, <laughs> no way I'm going to be able to tell this to Bernie and have him agree. So he said, I'll talk to Bernie. So he, he does. And about a day or two later, he calls me up and he said, listen, this is the bottom line. I mean, you know, Bernie knows who you are. I, I told him that you and I have written songs. He said, why don't you do what you think it needs and let us hear it? And if we're OK with it, we'll let you go ahead and, and play it for the group and, and record it if you want to. And that's what what I did. I, I sat down, kind of came up with the chorus idea that I that I had in mind for it. I was, you know, I had time with it to think about it and develop a sense of what I felt it needed. And it changed radically. <clears throat> it, it turned into the song, you know, from this uh, very dark, uh, half the tempo song. But there was just something about it. And anyway, you know, when, it, when we sent a little rough demo to them, we thought this is going to put the kibosh on it because it wasn't even a very good demo. It was just piano and me singing and, you know, a little rough drum track they said okay you know if you want to play it for the group okay so we played it for the group and the group loved it and i think that actually one of the guys i was working with might have snuck a little play uh, of the song for maybe for grace or for mickey uh because they didn't all seem to be uh hearing it for the first time ah <laughs> But anyway, they said, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah get this. Thing. This is cool. Let's cut it. I mean, it was that simple. And I think Grace felt like it sounded to her like it could be a hit, you know. She She's had good ears, good, good instincts. Yeah. 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 So did Mickey. I mean, and the whole band for that matter. It was a fun record to make. I love I love the the them trading lead of Mickey and Grace. It's it's such a great sound. But I want to talk real quick about what you're here to talk about, which is COVID-19 blues dropping yeah. on April 9th. Tell us, it was this kind of like a COVID baked uh, creation where, you know, you're just neat, you know, feeling this yearning to be creative while we're all stuck at home? Well, it was a little bit of that, but it wasn't initially my own idea. Uh, Deborah Silver, who was a, a fairly popular jazz vocalist, cabaret vocalist, who's made several albums that have done really well. Her last album actually was number one 
uh, in Billboard, and, and she's a great singer. And she came to me with this idea because she had COVID. She's a young woman. She had COVID and she was in very, very bad shape for 58 days. She was very near dying and she pulled out and came through. And when she got better, she said to me, you know, what about doing something in honor of the way we're all suffering and struggling, whether you had this disease or you didn't, we're all struggling because we're locked up in our houses, you know, the story. I mean, we've, we've all been affected dramatically by, by this uh, year. And I thought, you know, could be interesting. And she said, she's a, by nature, a very philanthropic person too. And she said, you know, maybe we could find a few organizations, more than one perhaps, that we could donate the money we might raise if we did something uh, uh, to these organizations. And I said, well, that would really be a nice thing to do. So we contacted the Jazz Foundation and the Actors Fund, and they both embraced the idea fully and completely uh, took meetings with us zoom meetings set it up that we could make them the beneficiaries they would support it in whatever ways they could help us in some ways and we just set a, a, out to write a song first that managed somehow to say what we thought it needed to say and i have to admit the first the first round the first you know go at it it came from the perspective of of someone who had had the disease because Debbie did. So she was singing a little bit about what it was like to have experienced it. And because of that, you know, she had the blues and, and so do a lot of other people. Uh, it didn't seem right when we thought about how it would uh, translate to other people who might be asked to sing it. If they didn't have the disease, they would feel very awkward. I'm, I'm sure of trying to say something about experiencing the disease itself and the symptoms and all of the problems related. So uh, I did a rewrite that took it out of that realm and Debbie contributed as well to, the, to a different lyrical uh, setting. And, and we made it more general and we and we really focused on how all of us have the blues because we're we're you know we're displaced in one way or another and we're hurting and once we did that and made a good demo people were really responsive and we started to reach out to uh, this goes back a couple of months to you know, various artists that we thought would be fun having participate in this from a wide variety of musical genres. And we've gotten, I think to date, it's happening as we speak. So there are about 25 celebrities that have agreed so far to say that they'll sing a part of the song. And, you know, we've divided it up, we've sent it out, we've done all kinds of, of prep work. And we have some very interesting people, people from Broadway, people from jazz, people from pop, from R&B, uh, you know, uh, it's a real uh, hodgepodge, but an interesting hodgepodge of artists that have all come together to say, yeah, we'll be a part of this. So, for example, you know, we have uh, someone I've loved forever, Tony Orlando. He's singing. Uh, we have Melissa Errico, the star of uh, My Fair Lady on Broadway. Uh, incredible singer. We have uh, Bill Medley. We have Melissa Manchester. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, Casey Abrams, Daniel Emmett, people who won uh, American Idol or The Voice. It's like a really interesting uh, combination of artists, young and old, from, as I said, from all of these musical genres. And it, they've all either done their musical part already or are almost finished. And we have a great team, a, a producer, a director, a video editor, and they're assembling the whole thing and putting it together and we look at it and we say no not this and of course i listen to the audio and make choices and it's a collaborative effort needless to say but it's it's going to be fun so we're going to listen to a little bit of the lyric video and this is just you and deborah singing on here Correct. yeah this is like our demo and there was you know a video i guess put together for it that we used as a promotion all right let's play a little bit of this and give everyone a taste okay I 
Everything that could go wrong did, but I simply refused to quit. I got the COVID-19 blues, they ain't going away. On a Monday morning, COVID came to town. And before you knew it, the country was shutting down. This was bad and about to get worse It's a plague on the universe And, and we, we thank all the heroes who bravely put other lives first I got the COVID-19 blues Cause I've been paying my COVID dues Everything You can fade that out, Thomas. Wonderful. That is wonderful. Yes. Really? All right, we're going to bring in Bob Sarles and have him join the conversation. Bob Sarles is a primetime Emmy-nominated film and television editor, producer, and director. He edited the Peabody Award-winning documentary series Moonshot, MTV's groundbreaking reality series The Real World, and many unscripted and documentary TV shows for NBC, ABC, Bravo, MTV, VH1, Discovery, FX, A&E, WE, TBS, Oxygen, TV1, and Netflix. Bob co-directed and edited the feature documentary, Bang, The Burt Burns Story, which premiered at South by Southwest. It was screened theatrically, and it is currently available for video on demand. Welcome, Bob. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me. Hey, Fritz. I'm so happy to see you, my friend. Good to be here. You you know, I'm not jumping in here, Wheezy, uh, uh, just to make this point before you start the interview, Bob, but... uh, Uh, This film uh, addresses an issue that's very important to me. And and Weezy will tell you, I've written a piece about race and it's called Race and Old White Guys. Hmm. And uh, and uh, it's to me, it's it's the mystery that is soul. And uh, it, it, it has nothing to do with skin color. It's this mystical thing that happens to human beings. And I think one of the great examples of that, two great examples. One is your film proving that uh, Burt Burns, this great producer and writer, wrote some of the most achingly soulful songs in the history of uh, the American canon. And the other example is uh, when Aretha Franklin went with Jerry Wexler down to Muscle Shoals and realized that this backing band that had made Wilson Pickett's records so funky were all white guys. And I just thought this is two of the great examples of, uh, of the fact that this is a transracial mystery that is uh, soul music. I just love hearing Bert's story, especially with his health background and everything. Yeah, well, his, his, uh, his personal story was that he had a rheumatic fever as a child and, uh, that caused him to have a condition that was going to cut his life short. And he knew that. And uh, that was something he lived with. And that's that really motivated him to be so successful uh, and have such a meteoric career. Uh, it, it also gave him a sadness and uh, a connection uh, to sadness that came out in his music and resonated with a lot of the artists that he worked with. And uh, and and I, you know, it was a revelation to me as I learned the story while I was working on the film, and uh, it, it it was you know, it's an interesting thing. It seems like most of the the great Christmas songs were all written by Jewish songwriters, right? And it was a revelation to me that all this great soul music had the contribution of a lot of Jewish uh, songwriters, without question, and. Uh, 
you know, I, I'd worked. Uh, the, the, the reason why this, the greatest comics in the world are Jewish, it's, they're an oppressed group just like African-Americans are. Right. The energy that came out of that. But, but just to make the point that you were saying, the, the, the songs with this heartache, like Solomon Burke's Cry to Me, Garnet Mims' Cry Baby, gives me goosebumps today, Peace of My Heart that he wrote and produced, the great song that was first recorded by uh, Aretha Franklin's sister. All these songs are mind-blowingly soulful songs written by this white Russian Jew from New York. Yeah. And, and one of the interesting things to me also is that at the time that these songs were written, you know, it was it was to feed a music industry. Uh, you know, there was a it, it was uh, there was it was product. You know, these the, the people in the record business were selling little discs of plastic and it was all about what's going to be hot now. And then they were. But as a song was a hit, they were worried about what the next hit was going to be, mm -hmm. because these things were sort of ephemeral. It, it was it was there. It was on the charts and then it was gone. Nobody knew 60 years ago that these songs would become part of the canon of the American songbook. Mm -hmm. We realize this now, but to them, it was like, okay, we had a hit. Now what's the next one going to be? Because, mm -hmm. And it was always that. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, Jerry Wexler, who is weaved in and out of this story and also, you know, the Aretha Franklin story. Jerry was always feeling like this rock and roll thing was going to be a fad and it was going to be over like in another six weeks. So he was always like sort of looking to like, uh, you know, make Atlantic records as, as uh, uh, profitable as it could be so they could sell it because he, he thought this whole thing was going to was going to end at any minute. In the film, you talk about how Burt's music is anguish and heartbreak masquerading as teen records, but teenagers are nothing but a raw nerve masquerading as a human. So this <laughs> stuff really resonates with them. And that was something that you maybe hadn't realized or they hadn't realized when they were attempting to make teenage records that the, the, the more heartbreaking and angst ridden and anguish filled that it is, the more teenagers identify That's with true. it. That's true. Oh, absolutely. It's apocalyptic when you're a teenager. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I just watched the Billie Eilish documentary and this is a girl who knows how to take her her pain and infuse it into her music. She's she's journaling through her music, and and fans are 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 just completely avid because she's singing their pain as well. And it's a gift to be able to have the ability to take anguish and carve it into into beauty. That's something that everyone can embrace. Did you have a thought there, Dennis? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's the inside view that people love to to be a part of and you know, watching somebody do what they do and, and watching it evolve and being on the inside of that experience is, is really quite special i think i agree hey bob let's put uh, bert into time and space here um his mentor before he turned into darth vader was jerry rexler at atlantic records Yes. And Bang was a subsidiary of Atlantic that they gave after he gained the trust of. But he was a writer and producer, correct? Yes. And, and that that's where he was when all the hits started to happen. Yeah. Well, he was sort of a late starter. You know, uh, he had all these aspirations about being a, uh, a recording artist himself and uh, had some failed attempts in the 50s. Uh, had tried to to do a, a record company at one point uh, that, that that didn't really work out, and uh, he was basically kind of a failure. And then he got a job uh, pitching uh, uh, songs for a publisher, and uh, that paid him fifty bucks a week. And so he had his foot in the door on a regular job. And from there, he sort of he he worked his way up. And and it was Jerry Wexler really who recognized uh, that this this guy had some talent and led him into uh, uh, Atlantic Records, uh, just about the time that Lieber and Stoller were on their way out, Burt came in and he became the, the house producer there. And he, he had a, a string of hits. And it really his career was only seven years long because uh, right. he, he dropped dead at the age of 38. Mm -hmm. Can you and, rattle off some of his hits for us, Bob? Well, Here Comes the Night, Twist and Shout, Hey, Hang On Sloopy. Uh, Peace of My Heart. Peace of My Heart, uh, Cry Baby, uh, um, oh, the, the hit by the Exciters, Twist Tell Him, shout. 
I'll tell him, man. Yeah, tell him. Of course, oh, yeah. of course uh, twist and shout. Uh, you know, he had he had hits that were recorded by, uh, you know, Van Morrison, the Beatles, uh, uh, Rolling Stones. I mean, it doesn't, you know, Keith Richards says in the, in the movie that he was, you know, one of the greatest songwriters of all time. Uh, you know, Paul yes. McCartney speaks highly of him. You know, he was a guy that was really revered. But because he died at sort of the apex of his career, uh, because his heart condition finally got to him, uh, and also because of the the craziness that went on with him and Amit uh, Erdogan and Jerry Wexler and 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 the uh, uh, the unfortunate uh, ending of their relationship uh, with Atlantic Records, and there was a whole bunch of mafia stuff that you know there was a whole mob story. Uh, there was a lot of bad blood about Bert, and and after he died, he sort of got erased from the history of of, uh, of rock and roll, and he was kind of a forgotten character. Why and do you was, think he? Why do you think he was so drawn to mobby guys? It was it because he felt maybe a little bit weak with his heart? I, I I don't know. I just think there was something about the action. You know, it was the '60s. It was that whole Mad Men era. You know, and there was this appeal. Uh, to, to the whole mob thing, you know, and it was when just you that, listen to his wife talk. You got the sense that they were very comfortable around mob people. <laughs> I, I She's think funny. I think so. But, you know, Eileen, I I'd had a bunch of conversations with her while she was still around. She, she's since passed. Uh -huh. But, you know, at the end, she was just adamant that, you know, uh, that Bert and Tommy Aboli were just good friends because they enjoyed <laughs> being on the boats together. You know, that yeah, they had a common interest in hobbies She boats. suspended a lot of disbelief regarding yeah. her husband. Yeah, she was trying Tom, to keep... Tommy was the mob guy we're talking about, like a mid-level main guy or something like that. Oh, and no, got... no, no. Tommy was... Tommy was uh, Tommy ran the Genovese crime family. Okay, never mind. I'm he was sorry. a big guy. <laughs> I now, didn't mean... Now, if his... anybody's listening from the Genovese crime family... <laughs> yeah. his, now, his, his buddy was this guy, Wazel. Who was oh, still alive? Was so when, Wazzle. And he Wazzle's was the best. He was not a made, made guy, you know. And uh, and he was he was uh, uh, Bert's buddy, and he's really sort of the heart and soul of of the uh, of the film, you know. And it's and listen, you know, Brett went on a one man crusade to get his father's legacy resurrected, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the because there were so many hits, you know, the publishing is you know quite profitable and so uh uh brett and his sister uh cassandra you know and, and his, their other uh, uh, siblings decided to invest a bunch of the family money into making this film you know it was interesting that the, the conversation earlier about how expensive it is to make these films when when brett found me i now i you know i get these calls several times a year everyone's got a great idea to make a film sure. and then i i'll take lunch or have phone conversations and what i usually do is try to talk them out of it because mm -hmm. you know i say look you know if you think you're going to make money on this you're deluded because these music docs just don't make money you have to have another reason to make it you have to have a passion to make it so when brett found me and we were talking to, you know he's talking about maybe bringing me on to help him finish the film, my first question was, who's got the money to make this film? And yes. how, how much money do you think it's going to cost to finish? And he convinced me that he was willing to put up his own resources to get this film finished. And it did cost the kind of money that Dennis was talking about. I mean, I think we had like maybe, you know, 85 songs in this film to clear, you know, and, and uh, you know, a, a lot of master rights, sync rights, publishing rights. It, it is a very convoluted uh, process. And, uh, be, but because Brett was so passionate about it, he wanted to get his father's story told, you know, he, he made sure that, uh, that the film got finished. And we've had the similar issues in, in terms of trying to get the film released. We've had a couple stumbles, but, you know, now finally, we did have a very successful run uh, in the theaters but I think we, we pulled it a little prematurely to get it on Apple Music, and that didn't quite work out the way that we had hoped. And now we're, we're finally in a position of being able to get it out more widely on other video on demand uh, platforms. All right, well, let's take a look at, hold that thought, Fritz, and let's take a look at the trailer. Going on one. The White Soul Brother, they called him. He put the soul in the music. Burns. You want 
one of the greatest songwriters of all bloody time. You know, he's a simple <laughs> rat. The guy was a genius. Shake it up, baby. Shake it up, baby. Twist it A lot of people think we wrote it. Well, shake it up, baby. Shake it up, baby. Twist and shout. Once he started cutting hits, he never stopped. He was the emperor of rhythm and blues. Everybody wanted Bert. Heartbreak and hope and anxiety and fear. Take the tempo down a hair, it's a little too bright. And they masquerade as teenage records. This is fresh, this is hot. That just knocked him out. And he wrote great songs. And he met a man, his name was Tommy Ryan, Tommy Edwards. He didn't know he was the head of the mob. What the hell are you doing with these people? <laughs> Take another little piece of my heart now, baby. Man, why didn't you give us that song? Bert Burns <laughs> scared important people in the record business, and they're still scared. I did it when I had to do. You got little Steven to narrate. Yeah, oh man, that was great. Wassel's yeah. my favorite character of all time right there. He's so cool. Yeah, me too. Well, I'll tell you about the, the little Steven thing. The, the way that uh, Brett had seen earlier films that I'd made, one of the things he liked about the films was that I, I often make the films without any narration. I, I, I figure out a way to let all the talking heads uh, have the narrative come out of those interviews. And as I went through the interviews that that Brett had collected, like for the eight years before I came on the film, you know, he got a lot of great stuff, a lot of really juicy stuff. And people opened up to him in a way that they wouldn't have opened up to me or any anybody else. But Bert's son, because it was they loved Bert so much and they opened up their heart to Brett. But he didn't necessarily have the experience or know how to get all the narrative of the story out of all the interviewers, out of all the interviewees while he was doing it. So I determined early on that we were going to have to have a narration track on this thing to sort of, you know, give us the connective tissue of the story. And what I did was I took the audio uh, reading, the audio book uh, version of Joel Selvin's biography of, uh, of Burt Burns which is a wonderful biography, but it's like over 400 pages. It's 18 hours, the, the audio book. But mm -hmm. I, I extracted out of it the, the 25 minutes that I needed to be the connective tissue. Now, I just had the generic author, you know, the author's reading, which wasn't even Joel. It was just some actor that they'd hired to do the audio book as our scratch track. And as we finished it, I explained to Brett, I said, now, this is an opportunity where we could get like a celebrity narrator to give the film a little bit of cachet and we knocked around names for a while and i i i remember um uh suggesting louise the the actor uh who played christopher and uh michael and, imperioli michael imperioli i and i and i heard his because he was doing some commercials at the time for yeah. some booze on the air and i i he heard his voice and i'm like that's like kind of the attitude that I like the sort of, you know, that Sopranos kind of wise guy attitude. He could have hung around with Bert. Yeah. 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 And 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 Brett said, well, what do you think about Stephen Van Zandt? And I was like, yeah, as if, you know, <laughs> how are we going to get this to little Stephen? And he says, oh, he's I'm talking to him every week. He's coming in as a producer on my Broadway play based on my father's life. And I said, you talk to Steve, little Stephen every week. He said, yeah. I said, well, my God, have him to the end. <laughs> so we were able to get little Stephen. And I remember uh, I flew to New York and went to Stephen's studio uh, in in, uh, in, um, in the Chelsea district, I think, near Union Square, and uh, uh, and he's got a little setup where he does his radio show. And so we were doing the narration, and I was sort of surprised to realize that Stephen hadn't really completely prepared; he hadn't read the script <laughs> okay. before, uh, as I had hoped he would. Uh, so he was reading and I realized he was giving us a cold read. And so I let him read a few pages and then he, we got to a stopping point. He, he said, how was that? And I said, well, could you give me a little uh, Damon Runyon? I was trying to, you know, I, 
a little, and he, he looks at me and he gives me the stink eye and he says, well, you want some Humphrey Bogart? And I said, yeah, a little Humphrey Bogart would be good. <laughs> and, he, and he looked at the script and then he looked back at me and he shook my head. It was just the Silvio looking at me, you know, and he says, with all due respect, I thought I was doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he went and he gave it another shot and, you know, he really, he nailed it right away. And I, I feel like he had just the right attitude. Yeah, great uh, flavor. I film. love hearing this one. Yeah. Yeah. It's really different. It's not what you expect in a documentary. So it's like, it's kind of like the attitude of the neighborhood. It sort of like puts you right there. Right. I, I think this film is uh, really well-timed, Bob. First of all, there are a couple other things going on. The Aretha Franklin thing on Nat Geo, which is talking about the whole uh, Atlantic Records, Jerry Wexler combination down there, and Atlantic being the main R&B uh, production house for that period of time. So people's awareness about that has been raised. And also, I think there's a curiosity of the old school music business, now that the music business is not the music business anymore. So it's almost historic record. It, it is historic record that you're putting down for people to it was it was an era where the people that ran the record companies actually cared about the music you know it was like it, it it yes everybody was in the business everybody was trying to make a buck mm -hmm. but they were in this business because of a love of the music yeah. and i think something happened as the as we got into the 70s and into the 80s and when the record companies started being run by the lawyers Instead yeah. of instead of by the guys that, you know, you know, I'm an Erdogan, Jerry Wexler. They had this office in New York when they first started Atlanta Records, when they were recording Ray Charles and Ruth Brown. They used to take the office they worked in all day and push the 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 desks up against the wall and turn their office into a, the recording studio. Like that's where the early Ray Charles stuff was recorded. Crazy. I mean, these guys loved the music and mm -hmm. that's something that's been lost. And I think that the Burt was one of, you know, the, that last generation that came up that really, you know, it's from the heart. It really is from the heart. And that's mm -hmm. why I think that's why the music resonates so, so much. A little bit more music than business, you know, in that time period. The people at the upper levels were people that were there because this was what they wanted to do with their lives. Like Clive Davis, as a, as an example, you know, mm -hmm. that that guy just loves music. So it wasn't it wasn't lawyers as much as it was people that live and breathe music, as right. he said. And those guys had a gift for hearing something they knew was going to be a hit. The story about the McCoys thing, somebody went to the Catskill Mountains and, oh, yeah. and, and the McCoys song had been revamped from some other earlier presentation. It was kind of tinny and bubble gummy and everything. But Bert heard that and said, no, that's a hit record. Bam. Right. And the way that you wove those guys into your film that, and that the three so of them recounting events together oh, is the just, strange be loves. just yeah. beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, Richard Goddard, who was one of the strange loves. I mean, he went on, I mean, the orphanage today, one of the you know biggest entities in the, in the, in the entertainment business, that's Richard Goddard. And he continues to, to do, to produce great music uh, to this day, you know? Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a really, really great. It's so, and I think too, Fritz, to your point, it's time for, it's a time when everyone who loves this can go to school. All this stuff is available. When I saw Dennis's documentary, I, I went to a screening at a festival you did not, ha and I had to be there because my cousin Alan told me about the film and I said, I need to see this. So I, I had to be there. You have access now. You don't have to go to a festival. This stuff is is getting pumped into these streaming services and, and kids, if they're interested in this music, they can go to school, they can go to YouTube, they can go to streaming media and they can, they can uh, layer knowledge upon knowledge upon knowledge to, to where they become experts on I stuff. think you're 100% right. And I think documentary films might be the genre that benefits from the streaming thing the most. Because if you, if you look at people's desire to go out on a date night to go see a film, even if it's an art house film like The Langley's or something like that, uh, you're, even if you're interested in the subject matter, you're less likely to make that a social evening. But uh, streaming gives you an opportunity to sit there and watch these things. I'm, that's what all I've done during the pandemic is watch documentaries about stuff I don't even care about. But it's out there. It's a learning experience. So you're right about that. The, the yeah. problem is, though, 
uh, speaking on the reality part of it is making money is, making is, money. is yeah. that uh, there are a few projects which become marquee projects like the tina turner thing that just came out yeah. and and they're they're things are sort of preconceived that you know netflix or hbo will get on board with and and develop uh but most of us are working in the independent realm and we're making these films independently because no studio is going to come in and make a film about dennis or and no film studio is going to come and make a film about burt burns as worthy as these stories are so it takes you know the people who are passionate yeah. to make these films now you make these films and you try to find distribution for it now all these entities amazon hulu netflix hbo showtime they pick these these independent projects up like low frame hanging fruit mm -hmm. you know and they'll pay dollar they'll pay dimes on the dollar uh, of yeah. what it actually costs to produce these films mm -hmm. and that's why you know the business model it's great for the content providers because you know, they're just putting out all this content for the content creators. It's almost never been tougher because um, there aren't there is no longer, oh, you know, these endowments for the arts where you can get, you know, that are grants that you can get so easily to make these films. These films need to be made in a way that they can be profitable. And it's and they're very expensive because of, uh, you know, rights and clearances in our, you know, we have the same thing uh, with our Chicago Blues documentary, Born in Chicago. Which was a film Excellent. that was, Excellent. which was, uh, you know, a dozen years or so in just gestation. Again, it was a, a project that came to. Uh, I work with my my wife, who's also a filmmaker, Christina Keating. We're partners together, and uh, the Chicago film came to us. Uh, it had been in film festivals, and and the the producers of the film were never really quite happy with it. So they asked us if if we could fix it. And the first time they came to me, I said, well, I don't want to just play Mahjong with what you have and, you know, recut it. I said, I really, if you want this to be a better film, I have a way, an idea to reimagine it, but it's going to be expensive. And so they went away. And then a couple of years later, they came back and they said, no, we really want you to fix it. So we did that. And then when we finished the film, everybody loved it. And then I said, okay, well, now we have to pay for it. And they were like, oh my God, it's so goddamn expensive, you know? And so it took two years for them to make a sale to, to uh, UK cable to give them enough money to clear some of the stuff. So we finally went in two years later and finished the film. And it's, and um, you know, it's interesting because one of the producers of the film is, is Richard Foose who uh, owns shout factory and was one of the originators of, of Rhino records. And he's sort of usually on the other end of it. He's usually the guy that's picking up the low hanging fruit you know, and now he's on the other end of it. He's, you know, involved in the production of the film and he's incredulous that nobody will offer us what this film is worth, you know, to, to release it. So now we're sort of in that, you know, that same purgatory thing that, that Dennis was in with his film, you know, trying to find some domestic distribution for this, you know, I think is a wonderful film. Yeah. And I ran into that, of course, with the cow sales because there, there were not just the rights of the songs, but any kind of TV appearance, do uh, you have to pay for all that? If the Mike Douglas catalog is exorbitant, uh, it, it's just crazy. Once you once you start trying to clear everything, you know you have to clear it uh, in perpetuity international. For and my my film aired on Showtime, but I had to get insurance and I had to you know I had to promise them no one's ever going to come out of any woodwork and claim ownership of anything. And it's just there's just a lot of stuff that you need to check off before a film is cleared. And it's crazy. It, if you had known going into, <laughs> into it, how difficult it was going to be to get across the finish line, do you think it would have given you pause in terms of making the film? It's a good question, Bob. And I, I don't think so. Cause I, I tend to finish things. I tend to be a finisher, but the thing that I will say to filmmakers is that clearing is not as much fun as making a movie. Making a movie is fun to me. I love this form of storytelling, but the clearing of every little piece of the film into making, making sure that you have the rights to release it, that's painstaking and, and, and very, very expensive. So there, Maybe moving forward, there could be some solution where where people would sign up for, all right, the, this is a great song and I want people to hear it. But if you bought up like the Righteous Brothers catalog or whatever in the 80s, 
you do, you don't fall for that. You just want to get paid. You're right. like, I spent a lot of money on this catalog. And if you're going to use my stuff, you're going to pay me. And there's no talking them around any kind of, you know, y- y- one hand washing another kind of uh, approach to looking at things. I think there's a sad irony in both of your films, in Dennis's film and in your film, Bob. And that is that it's not just like you're playing little needle drop clips from songs other people wrote and produced. This was done by you. This is your work. And or, or the, the person who you're doing the film about. So mm-hmm. I, I think there ought to be a pass with oh, I see. Of rights. Why why can't they like a, a special circumstance thing? If you had something to do with the production, even though you don't own the catalog anymore, it just seems to so me you're like seeing it would be more in uh, in in alignment with a with a fair use type of a fair use yeah, deal. Like, if it were a film about Dennis Lambert, a film about Burt Burns, a film about the Cowsills, you should be able to acquire those those pieces of music yeah fair use well when when you've got when you've got entities right now handing off you know these huge checks to bob dylan david crosby stevie nicks for for their catalogs these things have all made headlines these people aren't writing these big checks as a uh a way to make sure these artists are going to retire well they think they're going to they think they're going to make money you know and and now you know they have to monetize their investment. And that's what we're up against. Now, we're not, again, it goes back to what I said before. We're now not dealing with people that necessarily love the music, but they see the music as a commodity. It's a product that, that you know, you can make money off of. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, the, and the irony is that the, the, the last people that are really going to be making the most money out of it are the people that actually created it. Yeah, created exactly it Because it's right. gone through so many hands by now. Right. Oh. And, and that was true, you know, with, with Brett, I mean, Brett was in a better position with clearing the Burt Burns film because he still had an interest in, in most of the publishing, mm-hmm. but there were a lot of other partners, you know, uh, and, you know, over the years, publishing gets sold and traded. Oh, it's and, very muddy, and even just combing through it and trying to figure out. I mean, I hired someone to do this for me and she's pulling on all these threads and just trying to, she, she kind of told me that you have to make a good faith effort to find yes. the person who's supposed to get paid. And if you, if you just can't find them, you can put it in your movie and hope for the best. But Well, you know, and you're... also, and also what you, you should do also is to put a little bit of money in escrow. You know, okay. so in, in case these people ever show up, I see, you know, I mean, I've had that happen, not necessarily with music, but I've had it happen with with photographs mm-hmm. uh, where somebody contacts me six years later because I used a photo in something. And then I, you know, this happened to me for many years. I produced the uh, induction tribute films to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, right. induction ceremonies. Right. And one year I, I did the one on, on, on uh, Dr. John. And we have this wonderful photograph of Mac Rebenack, Dr. John, uh, in the studio playing a guitar. It was sort of a rare photograph. And we tried our best at the time. I really wanted to use the photo. And we could not find the photographer who took it. And so we had a paper trail. We tried our best. We put in, in escrow the amount of money that we were negotiating with everybody else for their photographs. And then seven years later, somebody, you know, sends me the nastiest email, you know, oh. about how I stole his, his intellectual property and, da, 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 and I'm going to sue you. And the next lawyer, you know, you, this needs to be pulled off the internet and all this stuff. And he left his phone number and I called him up and I said, Hey, listen, we were looking for you. I'm so glad that we found you. We have money in the bank waiting for you. And suddenly he was like, so happy. Oh, see, that's <laughs> the way to handle it. And yeah, he, he was just... like, Oh, great, great. You know? So usually it's just a matter of, you know, trying to find these people, but it is, mm-hmm. it is a big effort you have to put through, you know? Yeah, you really do. So we're going to have to wrap up now, but before we go, I want to, I want Dennis to tell us where we can find and when we can find COVID-19 blues. Okay. Well, it's, uh, it's going to be officially released on April 9th. That's the version with all the celebrities and a lot of uh, what we did, uh, we did a challenge with the public and we asked the public to send in their little homemade videos, whatever it is. And what, what is it that helps you through these blues? Sometimes that, you know, people sent in like uh, little clips of them and their dog or them and holding up a picture of their grandkids. We have all kinds of uh, frontline workers who did little bits for us. And all of that is being into cut into the into the final video. So oh, April wonderful. 9th, you should see it on on a lot of the streaming services and the music services. And, and uh, that's our hope. 
Oh, that is wonderful. Well, we will be eagerly awaiting that. And Bob, where can we find Bang Burt Burns Story? Uh, Bang the Burt Burns Story is now available on uh, Amazon. Uh, you have to rent it. It's not part of the Amazon free with the service. But if you go to Amazon Prime Video, you can uh, rent it or buy it there. Google Play, YouTube, uh, DirecTV, and a lot of cable outlets will have it as a video to, on demand. Also, if you go to their uh, website, bangtheburpburnstory.com, you could uh, go old school and buy a DVD. Fantastic. We will. We I highly recommend that you consume both of these gentlemen's wonderful products. Really? But I, I just love both of them for almost the same reason. It's Fantastic. Okay, right here, here come the credits. We would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where we are Media Path Podcast. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. We would love to know what media you've been enjoying. You can contact us at our social media or email us at Media Path Podcast at gmail.com. So I want to thank our guests, Dennis Lambert and Bob Sarles. Our team includes Dina Friedman, Francesco DeManda, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, and you. I am Louise Palenker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the media path.